All right. And this is the official 2022 recap. Uh, I'm here today with Josh Galicki, one of the, I, I think, and I say this every time I have him on here, I think one of the most talented wildlife photographers and um, a, a terrific bird photographer. But I, I put him in the wildlife category because he, he does a lot more than just birds now. Um, we're going to talk about 2022, some of our favorite moments, some of our favorite images. Um, so, Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. Happy New Year, everybody. Great to be here again. Thanks. These are always so much fun, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. Now, you had, uh, let's just let's just catch up for everybody, because I'm not going to do full biography. You've been on the show several times. Um, everybody that, that follows me probably knows how good you are and how much I, I admire your work. But let's just talk life, 2022. Yeah, uh, 2022 talking. is, yeah, it, it was a pretty big year for me in the sense I made a transition. So I moved from Washington, D.C., and I'm out in the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, I moved in late winter, actually. So it's been a big change for me. And it's actually been great. And part of the reason why I got my new place, it's actually great for photography. I mean, who does that? I guess crazy people <laughs> like me. But uh, so I've been spending most of the year actually just exploring my backyard, seeing what's there and, and photographing as much as I can locally. I did a few trips, but uh, yeah, it's it's been a transition year, but a good one. I'm still working on the transition, but uh, yeah, it's great to be out here. Great so, to be closer to wildlife, too. And, and for those of you that don't know, Josh um, is from northern Pennsylvania. So you do still get back to northern Pennsylvania. I know we chat sometimes and I see that you're, you're back home. So you do a lot of wildlife photography down there, but you also do a little bit when you come back home up here. Yeah, Pennsylvania, nor northeastern. I'm from Luzerne County, actually, originally. a small little town called Mockinaqua, and it's awesome in the spring. Spring photography in northern, northeastern Pennsylvania is incredible. Um, even summer, there's some really great stuff to shoot up there. So there's nothing like being up there in spring. I mean, May and early June is magic up there. So I try to get up there as much as I can. Even this past year, I got up there a couple times. Not as much as I usually do, but uh, I spent about two weekends up there. It was great. And we're going to see, I think, a few images tonight from from your backyard, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've got a couple in here that we threw into the catalog that are literally taken. Uh, Josh lives on the kind of on the bay. So uh, I, I, I will tell you, Josh, I, I do these celebrity impersonations and I, I had it all ready to go. And I got so hung up this weekend with this YouTube thing. I didn't get a chance to do my Josh Galicki impersonation. Um, so I'd like to see that. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. Uh, but anyway. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, 2022 for me. Um, and I'm just going to bring up a couple images. I talk about this because I think you could relate to a little bit of this because we, we got you into native plants as well. I have a lot to blame. for you. <laughs> I've, put, I've been putting plants all around the new property and it's a lot of work. I was just going to go shoot the other day and I'm like, oh, I have to cut back the Royal Crown Veronica or whatever I have in the back. So I, I'm blaming you for that, Scott. <laughs> so I have done more and more around my my yard. In fact, when I looked for this this show and I, I went back through the archives from the middle of June through August, I literally didn't take a picture of a bird. I All I did was macro photography and flower photography. So for those of you that know me, you, you know I'm passionate about native plants. I've got another separate Instagram account just for native plants. Um, so I do, did some macro photography. I didn't throw a lot of it in here, but I said, you know what? We're talking about pictures. Let me throw a, a couple of my favorite macro insect type pictures in here. Um, and then then this is, what, what is the species, Josh? Which one? Is it the first? Oh, you, you, it's, it's number two. I forgot. Normally, Josh can see my screen, mm. but but because of these tech issues, Josh can't see my screen. Mm. But it's it's picture number two. Oh, that's bee balm you, or a minarda, you know as they would say, right? Minarda, that's that? right. That's right. Well, so, uh, this, by the way, is a an amazing, and, and I'm going to tell this because if you're a wildlife photographer and you want to photograph hummingbirds, plant a bunch of this. Uh, this is scarlet bee balm. Monarda didyma is the species, but you you put this stuff at your house. I have hummingbirds. There's four of them. Well, there, there's four because there's some juveniles floating around. Every every ten to fifteen minutes, one would be in this patch feeding all day long. I literally could just sit out there all day and photograph hummingbirds. I got bored of it, so um, I didn't really do much of it. And it's kind of weird. And I don't know if you ever noticed this, Josh, but sometimes when it's you have this amazing backyard, right? But sometimes when it's your backyard, you're like, yeah, I can do it tomorrow. Or and do you feel like that sometimes? Absolutely. Okay. No doubt. Yeah. And it's it's a lot easier, too, because if you're shooting in your backyard, whether it's macro birds or whatever, you know, if there's an opportunity, you see it, you can take it. And if nothing happens, it's easy to, you know, walk back into the house. So it's right. it's not that big of a deal, I guess. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I definitely feel that. 
there's less pressure. And I, I asked Josh to send me a few songbirds. Now, he did not do a lot of songbird photography. So I'm going to run through a few of my favorite images. Uh, we kind of, I, I tried to put some theme together for this. Um, I thought, let's show a few songbirds first. Josh didn't have any songbirds to contribute. It doesn't mean he didn't shoot any, but he just didn't, we didn't have one to enter in. You are going to see, by the way, some stuff in here. When I have Josh on the show and he sends me his stuff, I, I literally want to throw my camera in the wall. Like, I just want to throw it as far as I can. I get, I get so, like, by comparison, his stuff is so much better than mine. It's sickening. So anyway, I'm going to show you a couple songbirds. Um, this one's from my backyard, since we were talking about backyard bird photography. Uh, that's a cat bird from my backyard because I love native plants. I loved the uh, kind of the color contrast between this mountain laurel and this indigo bunting. So I just thought it had a nice... Uh, offset of colors and plus it's native plant so I always love that love shooting in meadows I've, I've found three or four meadows now that are pretty reliable for me this year so from a songbird perspective it's generally common yellow throats and field sparrows not a lot of species diversity but anytime I get to shoot in these meadows I really like it I like how this one came out uh this was hey, probably Scott what plant is that is that cone fl purple cone flower very, I'm gonna take a guess on very that. good We'll very you're, you're educating me. I yeah. have that in my pollinator garden, I think, per yep. your recommendations. So. Very, very popular <laughs> plant. One of the things that's interesting about this plant, one of the reasons it's good, um, it will feed sparrows in the fall. Those seed heads are very, very popular with sparrows. So they'll come in in the fall and they'll pick those seed heads out. And the, it's a very sturdy plant. So it serves as a good perch. When I go into the meadows with these common yellow throats, they, they're not always able to stand up on top of all the plants because they'll bend. But the common the uh, cone flower is pretty sturdy, so when they sit up on top, the cone flower doesn't move. So that's just a a pro tip if you're out there and you've got a field of cone flower. Good chance there's going to be some common yellow throats or field sparrows in there if you're in the eastern part of the country. And uh, yeah, that's a native plant to the. It's actually not technically I don't think native to to this area, but Ohio it certainly is West Virginia and I think parts of Western Pennsylvania. The the purple and the yellow go great together. The color harmony on that Scott. Yeah. I love I love those two colors when you put them together. And then this, I, I put this in as my favorite image for songbirds for the year. This is um, a sunflower field that that I'm, I'm fortunate to have access to. Uh, I will tell you, what, with this image particularly, it was about composition. And I loved the way that this this flower head, it, this, it, it's, it's weird how like little details to some people matter. And I'm really, really uh, particular about little things. Um, if you look at the angle of this, the head of the the common yellow throat, and then you look at the angle of the sunflower, the way it kind of bends, kind of mirrors each other, um, and I think that's really really cool. So anyway, uh, that that was my favorite songbird image of the year. Now I am going to switch over, and we're going to talk about uh, some waterfowl and wading birds. So I'm going to flip back over, Josh. I've got one of your pictures up now. Okay. I'm going to guess the species. I honestly don't know what the species is because uh, it's not labeled here. I'm guessing the species as a great blue heron or a great egret. Uh, I'm going to go egret. Great blue heron. Oh, damn it. Yeah, great blue heron. All right. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, I don't normally shoot stuff like this. Now it's more available to me. Most of the time I've shot, it's in and around. I would come out to the eastern shore, but not not as much as I, obviously, since I live here, I don't have the opportunities all the time. I Now I have the opportunities all the time. But I'm not used to good light. I'm used to crappy light, working in cloudy conditions or using artificial light and so forth. So some of the sunsets where I'm at, I've got incredible western exposures. And every once in a while, it will just light up. The tide was like super low this evening. And this was actually uh, behind my house. I was on a bike ride. And I was coming back. And I'm trying to get home as quick as possible because I see what's materializing. I ran in the back thinking I was just going to get a picture of like, you know, the sunset. And this great blue heron, we call him the judge. He's a local, and he just kills it. I mean, he is an amazing fisherman, right? So <laughs> the judge was out there, and because the tide was so low, he went a little further out. And the sun was great. I mean, it was Miami Vice. I mean, it's a point-and-click shot, but the light itself was just amazing. I think I shot this with my 100 to 500, so I kind of zoomed in. And If I had to critique this shot, so the, the moment was really cool. I really liked the moment, and the light was one of the best days in terms of sunsets for us out here, but you'll see that strip of blue water in there. That's a break behind that great blue heron. There's a little fishing pier and there's a break and that's the, the Eastern Bay in the back. You can see that little blue strip. It doesn't bother me as much. I wish it wasn't there, but overall just the scene and the light was pretty amazing 
Um, but I'm glad I hoofed it. I, I barely made it back. Uh, but once I got back, I probably had maybe four or five minutes and this was gone, this light. So again, when you're dealing with situations like this, you have to be ready because the light changes so quickly. Um, yeah. but yeah, 10 minutes, maybe max, this light was actually that deep red. And then it, it you know, receded back to like more pinks and blues. I don't have a picture up, but I, I can remember almost an identical scene where I was driving home and uh, behind my house is a quarry and I get snow geese and they're back there right now. I don't have a lot this year, but I get up to 40,000 snow geese in this quarry and it's literally my backyard. So uh, for about two or three weeks, they hang out there. And one day I had a, a similar thing where the sky was just crazy. And I'm like, I'm like rushing home. I'm like, get, grab my camera, jump back in the car because they can't shoot them from my house through the woods. So I, I run around to the other side of the quarry and it's literally like two or three minutes. And you're like, oh my gosh, I got to get, I, I got to get something in this light. Um, I, I think it's incredible. And we all know these moments. Like we all know, have seen this, this type of sky where you're just like, oh my gosh, anything that happens now, just give me anything and it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cause it really is more about, it's almost like a landscape, you know, it's, it's a landscape image with color. And then that, that bird just kind of sets it off and makes it part of the whole composition. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, and rare, I mean, maybe I saturated it slightly, but that was actually the scene. Very little post-processing on this one. So yeah. that's one of my resolutions too, speaking about it. And I did in 2022. I don't over, you know, sometimes I would spend a lot of time to post-process a photo. Yeah, I, I get through photos now pretty quickly. I don't try to go overboard with stuff. So anyhow. Yeah, I'm going to pull up another one here, Josh. This is free. Di I have to change my screen around because um, it cropped a little bit off and I wanted mm. the audience to see. Okay, so I think I have it up now so that the audience could see it. This is, this is a freaking amazing. Oh, the uh, buffle head. I shot yeah. this oh. actually just a couple of weeks ago and I got a floating blind. What was it? Mr. Yan gear. If I'm saying Jan, Jan gear, I think is okay. Swedish maybe, but anyhow, I got this Mr. Yan gear and it, th it, that cove, that same cove that from the previous shot, I went out there, there were tons of buffle heads, tons. So I get in the blind and I had a 600 in there and water was probably three and a half feet. So I was just on my knees. It's a sandy bottom. So it's easy. I just kind of crept up closer and closer. And I spent, you know, maybe 40, 45 minutes, great sunset. This is twilight after the sun went down. And this particular bird took off. They're chasing each other and some mating displays and stuff. Uh, what made this shot for me with the textures in the water, mm -hmm. I, I just like how the water textures are. Um, of course, you know, flying out. So I did a pano crop. Um, the color was great. The silhouette I like, you can kind of tell it's a Buffy. Um, again, I like to critique my own work. The wings break the horizon, so it splits the horizon. Eh, I was as low as I could on the water, but the water went back so far. I mean, I, I would have had to get higher and had the duck below horizon. But in any event, um, I like how it turned out. It was it was a pretty cool. I hope to get more of these in the next in the next couple of weeks. It's hunting season, so. <laughs> But I, I think, you know, at minimum, even if the next couple of weeks are tough in February, I'm definitely going to try again to uh, get some shots from these guys and, and front lit too. try to go out in the morning because I have a Western exposure. The light's always incredible in the evening. The, the mornings aren't that good, but uh, there's a lot of these birds in here. So I'm hoping I can get more opportunities. It, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to, to see that. And I'm just scrolling up so people can see um, kind of the setting. So you were one four thousandth of a second with 4,000 ISO. That is, um, by the way, that's one frame, right? When you say you did a pano, you didn't stitch together. Oh, yeah, one frame. Okay. A pano crop, like a 16.9, yep. okay. I think, maybe of what I did. And the reason is a lot of folks will look at the exit data on my shots and they'll say, wow, you really crank the ISO up or go further down. You know, why isn't the, your ISO 1,600 with a slower shutter? Whenever I'm expecting action, I like to get action. I'll always crank the ISO up because I want to have my shutter speed as fast as possible. So I'm okay with grain in my shots, especially if I'm expecting something. So I'll always try to get my shutter juiced as much as possible. So I'm ready for something like this to happen. But that's that's the typical reason. And I will tell you one thing about, and I don't know what you do. So you know, I'm a Topaz Lab affiliate. I'm not, I didn't plan on plugging that today, but I, I will tell you one, th one thing about noise reduction. When you're shooting silhouettes, you, you can get away with a lot of noise reduction because yeah. there's there's no details. I mean, the, the downside of noise reduction can be it creates artifacts or it, it kind of softens the subject. But when you shoot backlit in your silhouette, you're, there's really no downside to it. So if you crank the ISO all the way up and you don't like the grain, you can just come back in post-production. It just 
just knock it out and, and you really don't pay a huge penalty. By the way, I'm not saying you should do that with everything. Like front lit shots can be a little bit different if you if you're in a lot of shadows. Um, you know, it, it can get real noisy in there, and then you use noise reduction. It kind of softens the subject. So I'm not say, saying that with everything, but I will tell you, I think with silhouettes, they're pretty forgiving in a lot of ways um, when it comes to editing. You can also get away, and I, I don't think you did, you can also get away with like hue changes and, and you know, like you can shift the colors a little bit if you, if you need to and saturate. So um, just in general, silhouettes give you a lot of flexibility with, with post-processing because you don't have to worry about the details in the subjects um, themselves. So those, you know, you know what I do with color too, Scott, a lot of times, like even this image, I remember this when I processed it. Um, I would, I, I actually will do like a gradient filter and in the gradient, I'll cool it for the water gradient coming down up. So I like my, my water to be at more of a blue tone mm -hmm. versus the sky. So if you go a little warmer on the sky, it puts a yellowish sheen on the water, yep. which I don't, I don't like aesthetically. No so sometimes what I'll do, uh, I'll cool just the water, but not the sky. Agree. Just post-processing stuff. All right, I had a couple in here. Now, I, I don't know which one was your favorite duck. I, I, I think I had this one. That, that was my favorite duck. I don't know if that was yours. I had a couple in here. I had a really a couple really good, Im, uh, I shouldn't say good images, but good encounters with waterfowl this year. Had a couple pied-billed pied grebes. They're not they're not rare here, but uh, in, down south, they're they're kind of everywhere. You see them in, if you're in Texas, they're kind of, I hate to use the word trash bird, but they're, they're kind of <laughs> like everywhere. Um, but up here, they're not on inland lakes. You get them uh, once in a while in the winter coming down, but they're not super popular. They breed a little bit in Pennsylvania, but they're not like prolific breeders here. So to see them is pretty cool, but they're also, um, they don't seem very timid, the ones I've had, and they come very, very close. So I was, I was fortunate to get a few really, really close. I mean, these are like, this isn't cropped. This is about probably six to 8,000 pixels wide. Um, I had some really, I found a location that has really nice morning light, uh, had some buffle heads there that I liked. This was a couple weeks ago. I had a merganser in some nice back, uh, some, some kind of evening light, some glow behind same, same location. You kind of tell this is the same location, just the way it photographs. There's a American widgeon. I don't get a lot of these again, not a, not a duck we see tons of here in Pennsylvania on the inland parts, but we get them. Uh, and that was one. And then I had two that I really liked. This was one of my favorites. This is uh, right at sunrise. There's a light in the background that ripples the water. And I'm sure you, I don't, do you actually talk to your subjects? Uh, when you say talk, like when you're in the field? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, normally it's cursing if they don't come close, <laughs> okay. right? So no, I, you know, sometimes I guess I, I'll say some things because you want things to happen and you'll kind of vocalize it. Yeah. Um, but I've never, you know, talked specifically to him. Oh, I'm tell, begging. Tell me more about this. I'm, yeah, I'm curious. begging. So, the, like, like I see the light, and I know what I want. Like, this is the sweet spot. Like, if I get the other images, he's over there to the left or the right, it's going to be okay. But if he comes into that light, and it, again, you know it doesn't last too long because the sun's mm. going to rise and it's going to change everything. Um, so this is right at sunrise, and I'm just begging. I'm like, go to the light. Go to the light. Like, I'm, I'm literally talking out loud. Go to the light. Like whispering to myself, go to the light, go to the light. And finally, he just like swims right through it. And uh, I, I really liked this one. I think yeah, my I love how the light hits the face and the the colors are outstanding in this, Scott. It's an amazing shot. Yeah, I think I think that might be my favorite. I have one more. I, I might have put it somewhere else, but I have one more that was pretty close to my favorite. This was, this was like one and two, but I wanted to get back to one of yours. I like the vertical composition on that too. You, you, you've got um, yeah. the light reflections further down in the frame. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I wanted to accentuate that a little bit, so I figured yeah. I'd go I'd go vertical. Now, talk to me about this one. Oh yes. Yeah, so this is a this is your. Uh, this looks like a great. Uh, is it great or snowy? Oh, uh, uh, snowy. That's a snowy. Snowy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a typical action shot. I mean, we've all seen snow egrets hunting, and you know they're very active when they fish. They kind of move. Unlike the great egrets, they dance around and they're so much fun to shoot. Um, this particular shot, actually I got this out back. This was sometime in the spring. There's a pair of nesting snowies not far, um, just kind of down the cove. So I, I would see them almost every day and every evening. So they were a lot of fun to shoot. What was cool, it's a behavior shot. What I liked about the shot, the splash, how it comes all the way up and you can see through it, it's translucent and you can see its face. I have a lot of shots where they're pulling the fish out and you can kind of see the splashing everywhere. But that it, it's kind of like a consistent, it's like a little wave almost, and it kind of comes up. So I like the textures of it. Um, so yeah, that kind of stuck out. I was like, oh, okay, this is 
kind of an interesting shot. So I really like this one. What I like too also, and just, you know, from my standpoint, when it comes to bright white birds, like snowy egrets, when you're photographing them in situations where it's busy, like you could see in the back, there's Phragmites and, you know, marsh grasses and so forth. I'll go like negative, you know, I'll go like minus two on my exposure or maybe even lower than that. And I'll just bring the whites up and post. And you don't have to worry about doing a lot of burning or everything, you know, so I'll go for a dark exposure and just bring the whites out. And it has a, like, a, it's a low key look and you save a lot of time. Just, uh, so I did a lot with these birds in that type of environment because they hunt along the shoreline and I was in a kayak, so I'm shooting towards them and you have, you know, the shoreline and it can be pretty busy. Uh, but because of they're, they're so bright, you can easily do that. So, um, I, I, I was going to actually, ask, it's, it's amazing you said that because I was actually going to ask you in the field, did, did you shoot this to expose kind of for the whites and underexpose or did you do that in post? So you did that in the field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's just from learning over the years where I would try to, you know, push my exposure as far as I can. I mean, typically you want to get your, you know, you want to push your histogram to the right as much as possible and doing a good, you know, have a good exposure. But if I did that in this situation, the background would be brighter and I'd probably want to darken it to take the distractions away from the bird and that, that moment of action. So I just underexposed it. And then it's so easy, you know, you just brighten the whites and you just pull the white slider up and boom. I pulled up the uh, buffle head that I had shot earlier and I, w I wanted to talk, tell people this, the exact same thing you just said about exposures. And I don't do it just for all white birds. There are a few birds that are, are, mixed and there's two of them that come to mind actually hooded merganser is another one so this one uh and these buffle heads so it's a it's a combination of a really dark area and a really almost white area right next to each other and the camera can easily get fooled so often if you're metering and it it thinks it it's metering especially spot metering and you're hitting like the head on a hooded merganser that black part all of a sudden the whites blow out and once whites blow out, there's no way to recover them. You can't, there's nothing you can do other than, than clone something in from another image. Uh, you, you can't recover blown highlights. So uh, one thing I always tell people as they're, as they're photographing and learning is when you're dealing with a species that's got these dark white contrasts, or if it's an all white bird, you're pretty safe to underexpose. And, and I think you nailed it. You said two stops. That's about what I recommend. Um, from one to three stops, you can go down. And most cameras are so good nowadays that pulling up the rest in post doesn't add any more noise than if you had done it in camera. I'm not going to get into the whole thing about ISO invariant camera bodies, but there, there is this concept out there that basically says a lot of cameras, you can almost shoot down five stops and then pull it up five stops in post and you don't notice any difference as if you had done it right in the field. So I don't want to, I don't want to get off topic, but I will say uh, good advice from Josh about underexposing whites in general especially when you have a lot of it, because if you if you mess it up or the camera doesn't meter correctly, you can blow out a lot and, and you get stuck, you get in trouble. One thing I'll also say, if I'm in a situation where I want to have a high key image where you want to blow out the sky, the details in the whites don't matter in that case. So I'll go plus two, plus three um, and blow the entire sky or if you have snow. So there are situations too where you may want to have the background all white in a traditional high key shot. And the detail in the whites don't matter, so you can blow those out. As long as your subject, you know, has some mid-tones and your subject isn't white, obviously, you don't want to blow your subject out. But, right. uh, you know, I would say push it as much as you can in those situations, but avoid the artifacting where you start to get science and some of these other things around, like the edges of trees or the birds. Yep. So, yep. so I pulled up another image. Before I get to this one, Josh, I got your image of this uh, American bittern up here. I, I will answer one question. Uh, Edgar Molina asks if, if I'm in the water. Uh, this year, I, I honestly have not gotten into the water once. So I've, I've got a couple spots now that are really, really eye level uh, with the water. So I can get down. I wish I could get a little lower in one spot, but I can get down about six inches off the water. So I don't need to be in the water for those. And I have really good cover on either side. So it's kind of like brush to the left, brush to the right. I put a little blind up in front of me and the ducks are really comfortable swimming through this area. So I, I get these nice looks without having to get in the water. Um, I, I do have from years past, I've shown a lot of images from when I was in the water. Uh, Josh mentioned he has a float blind that he's using down in Maryland in that bay. So there's a lot of advantages to that. 
But um, no, for the images I showed uh, for those, I was not in the water on any of them. But I do want to get to this image now. Uh, this American bitter. What you you've done a couple of these over the years that show this look. It is the most ridiculous looking. <laughs> it is the strangest. You understand yeah. why, right? Because yeah. they're hunting and looking straight down all the time for for their food. Yeah. So they yeah. have evolved with these ridiculous eyes. That for yeah, birds in general, whenever you get them straight on, you know, even, you know, bitter and whatever, they always have a goofy look. It's either angry or it's like a shocked, surprised look. This obviously is the latter. This is actually a least bittern, Scott. Um, oh, okay. I got this. This is a uh, – I when did I take this? This was in the springtime. And I was driving this this road, all extensive salt marsh, and the bird flew right in front of me. It came right across the road. Um, so I stopped. And I, you know, you have to listen and hope they vocalize. And when these birds vocalize, at least bitterns, uh, it sounds just like a very similar to a black billed cuckoo, if anybody has ever heard that call. It's like cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And it's so subtle. And you think that they're like a mile away, but they're not. They're very close. Sawwet owls are like this. Certain certain other birds are like this too, where um, it's very hard to tell the distance. So I listened to the calls and then he was literally right there on the side of the road. And I finally, it took me about five minutes to spot him. And I just pulled my 600 and shot right from the window of my car. Um, I probably shot a couple hundred frames. This is a shot where the bird is actually calling. You can kind of see the air sac. Um, it's a bit inflated. Uh, and the head on look of course was, was the winner for me and he was perched, you know, uh, on each stock. I thought that was pretty cool. So yeah, it was, it was one of those things where, you know, you're just fortuitous. You're driving around and boom, there it is. I know it sounds cliche, right? Cause so many people, right. I was driving around <laughs> and I was so lucky and the great gray owl flew, but this actually did happen. Uh, so <laughs> it was on my way out too. The light wasn't that good. Obviously the light could have been better. It was backlit. Um, you could see that, mm -hmm. but thankfully, you know, in, in these high marshes, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of diffusion there and it wasn't super harsh and I was able to bring up the shadows a little bit, but it worked out. And, and by the way, if anybody has a question for, for Josh or I about moments of 2022, since that's the theme, um, put them down there. So if you want to know, you know, what was Josh's scariest moment, anything like that, just put it down in the comments. Um, I'll try to, I got one eye down there on the comments, so I'm kind of scrolling through and looking for him. Um, oh, this was, this was a, a image. So this was my, other, I, I had one waterfowl earlier. The, the, it was a wood duck with that golden image. This is my other one that I was kind of my favorite. I just love the pose. This, I, I, I had to research this. I didn't know. So it's, I shot this in late October and it didn't feel like a courtship type thing. I, wa I wasn't really sure there were two ducks there, but I wasn't really sure what this bird was doing because it didn't appear to be courting. And it didn't, there was no, no, there was nothing to be aggressive against. It wasn't like defending a territory. And so I, I actually researched and there was a couple people that had, have seen the same behavior in pied billed grebes. Um, and I forget what the, the answer they thought, they thought it was. They thought it was actually just them drying off. He was underwater earlier. So this one person said when he's observed them, he thinks that these are just birds that hold their wings out kind of to dry off a little bit, but he was in this position for like a good 10, 15 seconds. Uh, just holding that again with no no kind of mating or courtship behaviors other than just these wings out so when i first saw it i thought it was a, a display because often birds will like posture when they display for their mates um but i don't <clears> think <throat> that's what it was it was but it was a very interesting pose mm. um it had a really soft light and it kind of an angelic feel for it so uh it looks yeah, like was... a loon loons do that i've seen yes. common loons do that Scott. Yep, so absolutely we're... yep yeah, so I, I liked that one. And again, the light just seemed to work. It, it had these really soft tones to it. So, uh, yeah, I liked that one. All right, now let's go. Oh, God, you're killing me with this one. All right, so this is um, species uh, unidentified. Let me <laughs> let me scroll down here. I, I don't know what it is. Let me, I'm going to take a shot at it. So you got the uh, 600 with the teleconverter on for this one. And you're shooting this uh, backlit. And that looks like a small peep, and the bill isn't too big, so it's not a Dunlin, it's some kind of sandpiper. Could get warm, warmer. <laughs> could be a sander. I'm gonna go semi palmated. No, uh, semi palmated. No, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go sanderling. Um, very close. It's at least sandpiper. Ah, all right. So, but but very very close. Right. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's very difficult when you look at the silhouette to determine the peeps or whatever. Yeah, no, this, this shot was taken late morning. Light was pretty harsh. I actually was with um, Tyler Reber and Nick Patel. Yes. Uh, it was Labor Day, I think it was. And we were shooting egrets, and there was this pool of water, and the water was receding, so there was a ton of egrets, you know, fishing. So we were there for the, the good light when the light came up. They were all backlit. On our way out, another cliche moment, you know, we're walking out, but this is true. We were walking out. <laughs> And some shorebirds came up in front of us. Um, they landed. There was some yellow lakes, some least. We had some harsh light, but uh, the light was good in terms of the sun direction. So when you get a backlit image like this, you want to have as much of the outline of the bird as possible. If the sun is coming from a particular angle, you know, obviously the outline will be better on one side. Or So the, it was fairly even. I really like this shot because of the bokeh, obviously, in the front. Um, you have the little pool of water where it was foraging, and of course you have the outline of the sandpiper. So I kind of like those little bokeh balls actually even up by the bird as well, mm -hmm. how it floats in. Um, it was, you know, some cool tones, a little, some yellows in there. I just did a black and white conversion, um, darkened the blacks just slightly. The light was so harsh that the bird was, you know, completely silhouette. Uh, but yeah, and this was actually one of the favorite shots I got that day. Um, so we just, you know, these birds kind of... We, sh we shot probably a couple hundred images. These birds were kind of moving in and around cl pretty close to us, actually. Um, but this one I like for black and white. I was like, oh, actually, this looks much better than the color version. So. Yeah. A lot of people will do these color, uh, these bokeh balls when it when it's like golden hour. And, they're, they, you know, you see these like golden balls of light everywhere. That really works. I loved the black and white version of this. Now, the rim light on this is really pronounced. Um, did you have to bring that up in post or was that, or did you just kind of darken the bird and leave the rim light? The bird was pretty much as you see it, I darkened it slightly. I brought the black slider down just a little bit. Um, but because the light was so harsh and the contrast was so intense that, you know, it was now ideally the outline of, on the rump going to the tail feathers on the top. I wish that was a little more pronounced. So there was some angle with the sun, but other than that, um, I added some contrast to the bokeh balls. I'll typically do that to make them stand out. Yep. So I'll paint in some contrast there. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. And the, the black and white conversion was key, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I could see this one winning a contest someday. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. More, <laughs> more discouragement for Scott. Okay, let's get on to the next <laughs> image. Um, we, I had a couple birds in flight type shots. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this one. Um, oh, species. It is a got a curved bill. Uh, wim wimbrel. Hard to tell. This one's actually a clapper rail. Is that where is this from? Uh, this is Eastern Shore. This is not okay. far from my house, actually. I think the bird is. I think the bird, the bill is not as curved as I think it is. It might just be the angle too, yeah. in terms of you know. Okay, uh, so clapper yeah. rail. Most people, you know, obviously throw away the butt shots or the flying away shots. I kind of like this shot. There's something about it where it's flying into the habitat. So it's more about the story than it is bird in flight. And of course, you know, it's backlit. So you have the primary and the secondary feathers and the tail feathers all lit up, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see some bugs backlit in there. Um, so it's more of the story of it, you know, in its environment. It was flying across a gut. So normally what they'll do is they'll fly over the gut versus swimming through it. Um, and again, this was, you know, late afternoon, it was probably just close to sunset. I got it again. I'm going to, you know, I always critique myself what I should have done looking at this when I did the post-processing, I should have brought up the highlights in the wing on the left as much as the right. I would have done that a little more even, but that's pretty much how it came out. Uh, I didn't do too much on this one, but yeah, that's actually a clapper rail. Love clapper rails, all rails, actually rails and bitterns they're they're my peeps <laughs> yeah you and i thought you know what the reason i thought it was an american bittern because you did some work with american bittern i think yeah. last year and you said you had one that was pretty reliable they're very i'm telling you i i, I have not seen, in pennsylvania actually okay very few of them left yeah, yeah. Sad. the ones i've seen in pennsylvania by the way are few and far between i got a couple flight shots one time when one flushed um the other one it, honestly it was in the in this small tiny pond it, with a bunch of marsh area around it it mm. took me about 15 minutes to find it and it was right yeah. there yeah. it had its its bill straight up and it was literally just locked in position and it looked like everything else in that pond it took me so long i thought it wasn't there yeah. and then finally i was like oh my gosh there it is they are so 
hard to find in habitat unless they move. Yeah, they're absolutely amazing. And they're much harder to find in wintertime. Most people see them on the East Coast in the winter because they come down to the coastal areas and they're, you know, beige brown or tan. And all of the marsh is tan at that point in time. Everything's dead. Right. So they they actually fit in even more. When you find them on their breeding grounds, they're a lot easier because they vocalize. Mm-hmm. And their vocalization is this distinct gong, 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 gong. And when you hear that, it's like, okay, that's a bitter. So they're a lot easier to find on the breeding grounds. But wetland contamination, you know, loss, loss of habitat, I mean, it's really crushed them. If you go to certain states like North Dakota and some of the prairies, prairie pothole regions, they're all over the place. But in Pennsylvania, there's not many places left, wow. unfortunately, um, to see them. And they're an amazing, amazing bird. I'm going to move on to a couple flight shots. So I threw one of my flight shots in here. One of my, I, I'll put this up as my favorite flight shot of the year for 2022. This was a couple of snow geese um, in, in this quarry behind my house. There's a couple areas that are pretty interesting. But on this day, there was so much activity and they they swirl. So some are coming left to right and some are coming right to left. Uh, let me just, I'll, I'll scroll my settings up here. So this was a uh, 400 millimeters, 1 20th of a second F16. And so super slow shutter, 1 20th is getting down there pretty slow. And and what I was looking to do, and I, I go through hundreds of these frames looking for one where I can get the heads, where I'm panning almost perfectly with the bird. So you get the wing wing blur in the in the the from the wings, the motion blur, but the heads are relatively sharp. So if you look at that, and I can't zoom in on these because I downsized it, uh, but you know the heads are relatively sharp. They're never going to be at one twentieth of a second in flight. You're never going to get a razor sharp image. It's it's impossible. But the birds going on the bottom are actually going the opposite direction. So I thought it created, and then that line across the middle almost is like a mirror. So there's like this mirrored effect of the birds on the top going one way and the birds on the bottom going the other way. So I really liked that one. I, I will call that my favorite uh, flight image of the year. And I'm going to bring up, go ahead. I Josh. like how you have the line going through the middle of it, Scott. And you have the, you know, you've got the greens on the top yes. and the browns on the bottom. Yeah. I, I initially thought before you mentioned that the birds were going the other way, the birds uh, on the bottom or in the foreground were closer. Cause that's one thing I find too, when you do, you know, pan shuttering or slow shutters, mm-hmm. the, if the birds are closer, they're faster, right? If yep. they're further away, you know, they're slow, you know, so the, you have to adjust your shutter speed depending upon your distance relative to the birds. The yep. further away they are, the slower your shutter should be versus as close to it. So that it's anyhow, that, but it's, it's an interesting dynamic you have to watch when you're trying to do shutter blur. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And now, now speaking of pretty cool, now th- is it, this is an American bittern, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's I felt an American stupid. Bitter, yeah. I felt stupid about the least bitter. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm thinking this has to be an American bittern. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is an American bittern. This is crazy. Yeah. What was really cool about this, this was in the spring. Great experience uh, with this bird, but it's all about the symmetry on this shot. So the wing, actually, if you look, the wing position, the eyes, the feet, everything is almost, you know, it's very, very symmetrical. And I actually shot this looking almost up at the bird. So I was angled up. The bird actually flew over my head. So I had waders on and I was in, I was in the water when this happened in this wetland. Um, and I was happy that I got the bird above horizon. So, you know, he, the grass, you know, he, he doesn't intersect as much with the grass, the feet a little bit, but, um, it was a cloudy day, some nice purple tones, uh, cooler purple tones that come with some of the, uh, foliage and stuff in the background, uh, with the grasses. So I thought it was pretty cool. Um, the original shot, I cropped a little bit, the bird was centered. But I, I like the pano crop on this one, and I, I centered it in the composition. It just made sense in the, in the sense that it was coming directly at me. But uh, it's hard to get these guys in flight. So I was really excited about it, but more excited just about the symmetrics of it. It's, it you know, kind of looks like a B-52 yeah. or something. And, and you know what's crazy? Because I've, I've, I've gotten this a couple times with these um, almost perfect symmetries. They are super, super appealing. Yeah. And In fact, when, you, when, you're, when you're scrolling or you're looking at images and you're just kind of checking things out, and you see something that is really symmetrical. It it is just it's it's sexy. Like it's there's just yeah. something about it. It's just like it's eye catching. I will. I'm going to be honest with you. I saw this on Instagram, and I scrolled right past it. This small formats do not do this yeah. justice. In a small format, I thought the bird was flying away, and I'm like, yeah, Josh posted <laughs> a weird picture of a bird flying away. Like, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's cool, but why did he? And you can't see it. I, I hope the YouTube audience can see that this is dead on. I mean, the eyes are like 
dead on and the wings are dead on and it's coming for a bittern to fly right at you is weird. Like, are you camouflaged or, or do you think it just was, that's just where it was going? So that it was flying, there were two areas and I was in the middle of it. So there was a wetland in front of me, which is what it was flying out of. And there's actually, a, there was a little body of water that it would fly over and go into this dense, like blueberry thicket behind me. And it was flying back and forth that there was a mating pair there. Um, this was early on. They didn't have any young or anything like that. So they were vocalizing and the like, but, um, yeah, it's just one of those things where now this is right when the bird launch. So that's the best opportunity or right yeah. after the launch where you want to get a shot like that. Yeah. Um, because once they launch and they're in flight, it's, it's, it's not actually that appealing. You know, they have really broad, uh, the way their wing beats are mm -hmm. and their, their legs will dangle down a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, when it was taken off. So it was really cool. I, I, when I looked at this shot, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that was the shot just in terms yeah. of the symmetry of it all. Yeah, it, it, that's great. And I am glad I saw this because again, when I saw it the first time, <laughs> I just scrolled past. I'm like, yeah, because I saw you're, it on Instagram. Right. It, it, and Instagram yeah. is so terrible for some images. This is, um, I, I, it's cropped a little bit on YouTube. It's a little wider than the actual. So you can mm. imagine seeing this on YouTube. It's, it's, it, it's gets sized down to 1080 wide. It's probably down to like 800 pixels tall. And it's on a tiny little phone most of the time. And you just don't see some of these details, but this would look amazing. Like just printed on a wall because it's, it's really, really powerful. I just, yeah, I really, uh, like I said, I'm glad you, I'm glad I saw this the second time. Cause I'm like, all right, now I get it. But it's true though. I mean, some pictures are better thumbnails than others. You're right. Especially when it comes yep. to Instagram, you yep. know, I, I agree. Yeah. A lot of the environment stuff just gets lost on Instagram. That's the one bad thing about it, unfortunately. Yeah. Now I pulled up your next picture. Now this is uh, I, I didn't put I didn't put any Raptors in. So my favorite, mm. I don't have a favorite like Raptor of the year. I'm not sure. Or I should say, I, I said Raptor owl. I don't, I don't think I shot an owl in 2022, <laughs> but you did. So you got a snowy owl. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about this because it's, it's really, really interesting. I, I, I've seen this a couple different people that I follow down in that area. Um, this snowy owl was hanging around for a few days. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I was still in DC. I didn't move at this point in time. And some folks reported there was a snowy owl down at Union Station. So if anybody's been through D.C., Union Station is like the Grand Central Station equivalent in D.C. You have constantly people coming in and out. And this owl was literally perched just above the entrance, and it was hunting. There was this grassy area in the front, and it was super cold, I remember. Uh, and it was hunting rats and pigeons. And, you, you know, it was just flying around. Of course, there were a lot of birders and stuff there. The word got out on it pretty quickly. But I went one night. I just decided to try. I try to avoid crowds, but I said, you know, this might be worth it because it's close to home. And the bird flew in at a specific time. It, I don't know where it came from, but it came in and it landed on one of the um, – there was a promenade in the middle and it landed there. And then it flew over to the main uh, the main building, Union Station, just above the entrance, and it landed on this statue. I'm like, oh, that's a cool shot. So, you know, I kind of walked up. I had my 100 to 500 snap. And I did some research. That's actually, I'm like, I wonder who that even is. Well, it's Archimedes <laughs> for what it's worth. Okay. You know, they have all these statues there and, you know, okay. gargoyles and busts and so forth. But yeah, and it, it perched right on his head. So I'm like, okay, this is a pretty cool shot. And I've actually been getting more into the human element aspects with nature too. I've been doing a lot of that this year. Not really in, in so much as the shots we're going through, but I have done that a lot and I'm really liking it. You know, when you incorporate man-made elements or human interactions with animals, this one was pretty cool. Um, I photographed snowies before, mostly on beach. Uh, I photographed them on the tundra in Alaska, never on Archimedes. <laughs> so this was, uh, this was a pretty cool opportunity. Um, and there were, you know, there were a lot of photographers there. There was another sequence. I, I didn't process it yet, but it landed on the top of an American flag, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was, and actually the flagpole had like an Eagle on the top of the flagpole and it was, it perched on the Eagle's wing. So that was actually oh, pretty cool. Yeah. And you shot, now I assume you had to have a tripod. You shot this, I, I was looking at the spec. Uh, handheld actually. Oh, wow. Okay. So let me go down again. One fortieth yeah. of a second. Yeah. That's pretty slow. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm not sure that might've been the R5 or the R3. I can't remember, but the IBIS in these new uh, mirrorless cameras are dynamite. It's through the roof. I mean, I can go, I've got some waterfall shots from the fall. I was just hand holding. I didn't even need a tripod. I mean, I'm wow. a third of a second 
That's yeah. crazy. It's incredible. Yeah. I, I saw that and I just assumed because I, I, I looked at the choice of lens because you were at uh, 7.1. That's the minimum aperture on that lens at 500, I think. Yeah, that's okay. right. So, that's so I'm like, oh, why did he shoot at 7.1? Like, there's no light there. <laughs> and then I looked at the lens and I'm like, oh, I think that's the minimum aperture. Why, like, why not take your 600 for that? It was so cold and there were so many people there and I'm thinking, ah, if I go with a tripod, I just wanted to okay. walk around. It was kind of gotcha. a casual shoot. Yeah. So if I took it more seriously, I would have had my 600. Okay. I think of it. Yeah. Uh, I was just yeah. wondering, I was just wondering like in your head, it was, it, was it intentional or was it just kind of convenience? Cause the 100 to 500 yeah. is a fairly easy, nimble lens. Like you can just walk yeah. around with that thing, right? Yeah. Okay. It was all about convenience for okay. that, but I didn't even know if the owl was going to come out. And thankfully it did that night. I want to say, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. That, there were a ton of photogs there. And the owl stuck around for like, I think, a couple of weeks. So okay. a lot of people I know have it on the American flag, which, you know, it's it comes from Canada, this bird probably. So I guess it's patriotic. But, you know, I think of Canada when I think of a snowy owl more than I do uh, the United States. But A couple questions came in. So uh, Nikki Nobles asked, what are your favorite or preferred habitat? So if Josh Kalicki can choose any time of the year, so let's not talk about the species. Let's just talk about the like the environment. Like, where do you feel like, OK, when I when I snuggle into this spot, this is this is home for me as a wildlife photographer. Well, for many years, it's always been um, mixed hardwood, little boreal pockets, nice fog, May, mid-May. You know, the streams are moving. That is nirvana for me. <laughs> but, you know, this past year being down on the bay, the I've bay. mostly been, you know, on the shoreline and coastline stuff. So it's kind of a new thing. And I'm falling in love with it just because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's close by. It's a whole different type of shooting, different birds, better light. So, um, you know, that's kind of my new thing right now, being along the coastline. But historically, it's always been in boreal pockets, yeah. no doubt. If for, for me, I would say it's too, uh, God, I, I mean, I love so many things. So I love these, the the summer meadows when I can find, I mean, and, and I think the, 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 that native plant side of me has seen these restoration projects in Pennsylvania, which are really, really encouraging, where they've gone through and just removed invasives and they've started to replant. So I think over the last two or three years, I've, I've gotten more into these meadows, these like summer meadows with, with native wildflowers. Um, I will tell you that at my heart always goes back to fall. And just sitting on on the the ridges of Pennsylvania, and you know, kind of how this geography works around here. There's valleys and ridges, and valleys and ridges, and valleys and ridges. And, it, and if you look at the uh, topography of Ten Pennsylvania, that's very typical of central and eastern Pennsylvania. Um, so the elevation changes are, are pretty up and down. There's a ridge, then there's a valley, then there's a ridge and a valley. So just being up on the top of the ridges in fall during hawk migration is probably kind of what I would say is is home for me. The same way that the those hardwood forests are home for you in your soul. Uh, that's probably home for me. I had one more question about um, kayaks. So I'm going to throw this one to you. I've, I've shot loons from a kayak. At the mm -hmm. time, I was using a DSLR. And man, I can tell you one, one huge advantage of mirrorless. I could not track loons right in front of me with a DSLR. The, the autofocus... Uh, there's a different mechanism when you flip to live view. So you take that screen. I'm going to try to show this with my hands, but you take that flip out screen and you pop it up and then you drop your camera down. So you're looking at the screen is fairly useless on many of the DSLRs I use. But when you use mirrorless cameras, it's the same thing. So it's the same as the tracking systems are the exact same as what when you look through the viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder. So I will tell you that had, that I would love to redo some of those kayak scenes that I had with loons back in the day um, with my with my mirrorless. But uh, for you, you do shoot from a kayak occasionally. I do. I've got um yeah, it's not an expensive one. It's a couple hundred bucks. I think I paid for it. Um, and it's a sit in. So rather than a sit on top, I prefer the sit in because you can get lower to the water. And exactly just like you said, Scott, with mirrorless, you know, you can hold it out and put it right near the waterline, go in live view. And with the AI tracking, it's so easy. You know, it's just, you know, it tracks the bird. And even for action, I mean, years ago, that would be impossible if you had, you know, an egret moving and hunting or the, the uh, duck taking off or whatever. It would be very, very difficult to do that. You can actually do that um, handheld. So. And somebody asked about kayaks. I will tell you this. I, I own three kayaks. Um, oh, wow. And one of them... Uh, if you're ever shopping for a kayak, flat bottom, they, they call them like fishing kayaks. They're much wider, much more stable. They're a pain in the ass to paddle with. 
So they don't, they, uh, the thinner the kayak is and the longer it is, the truer it is, meaning it'll go in a straight line and the faster it is, the fatter and wider it is, it's less efficient. So it goes slower. It does, it kind of goes back and forth as you're paddling, which isn't convenient, but for photography, it's also much more stable. So you, you, you do have to kind of balance and find one that, that does a little bit of each and you have to figure out, am I going to be paddling long distances in which these flat bottom wide kayaks aren't very good or do I want one that's narrow? Um, so you just kind of have to, and I, I also had a friend that had an inflatable kayak and I was like, eh, I kind of poo pooed that. I didn't think it was a great idea, but it was very stable and it, it worked very, very well for photography. Now, if it gets a hole in it, you're in trouble. So you wouldn't want to take it in areas that have a lot of sticks and branches. But if you know the lake, if you're going to the same lake all the time, uh, inflatable kayaks are cheaper. You can throw them in your trunk and collapse them down and then you can inflate it and use it when it's ready. And it because it's it's wide, um, you know, kind of works. So a hole it, would be a good thing in an inflatable, Scott, because when the air comes out, <laughs> as you the get side closer, is lower. You have a few minutes of really good, you know, water line. Up. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I did get one more question here before we switch over. I'm going to pop one more image up here. Uh, have you ever shot in Northwoods of Maine and New Hampshire? I have been to New Hampshire um, and I shot, that's where I shot loons a couple years. I think I went there twice and shot loons. Um, so yeah, I, I, I loved it there. It was so remote. You could just drive down the roads in the woods and you'd find, you know, warblers just kind of hanging off the trees. And these aren't like, you know, here you have to kind of dig into the state game lands a few miles to, to get to start seeing the birds uh, up there. It was just like, here's a here's a road and you'd be driving and you could hear a black burning warbler right over your head driving down the high like the, the side roads. It wasn't like, you know, you had to be way out because everything is out in the woods. So have you gone up there? You, you go to Canada once in a while, I think. Yeah, I've been to uh, I went to the white. Where did I go? White Mountains. Um uh, what is it? Mount Washington. Is it Mount? Is it what's the tallest one? I should know this. I'm I'm drawing a blank. Mount Washington, right? Yeah, I went up to Mount Washington for Bicknell's Thrush years yep. ago, and I shot in Wrangley, Maine, if that's right. Um, and then I've shot in and around uh, down east, um, down east Maine, Winter Harbor, some of those areas, and it was incredible. Yeah. It's great. I was there in the summer months, so it was great for you know breeding breeding birds, um, puffins, of course, gulls. Uh, it's absolutely stunning. I love Maine. New Hampshire's gorgeous too. Yeah, I got a picture of a a lion up here. What's this about? Oh yeah, we're into non birds it's, now. I did a couple of non birds, like favorite non birds <laughs> of the year. So, th was this this year? Yeah, actually, yeah. It was in the beginning of the year. I was in South Africa. Um, this was one of the trips I took, and it was my second time in South Africa. And everybody's seen these lion shots where you have the you know the tight portrait in the mane. I mean, this has been done a million times. What was unique for me and what I loved about this shot, this is actually a white lion. There's only four in the wild in South Africa. There is a mother and two, I think, two young females outside of Kruger Park, and there's only one male. This is the male. They call him Casper, and we came across him one morning on a game drive, and uh, he just walked right by the vehicle. So I got a, you know, got in, did a tight shot. And you could see, you know, the blue eyes and the... Uh, the white coloring. And so I thought it was super, super cool. Um, it's so rare to come, you know, come across a white lion in the wild. Most of them are in captivity in some other countries and there's not many of them. And but, just, uh, just curious, cause I, I, I know zero about this. It, is a white lion just a, a, um, a, a, a genetic. It's a recessive trait. Rece that okay. would assume it's not, it's not a, just, it's not a species. Like there's not a, no. it's, it's just a, okay. So it'd be the yeah. same as like a red bear is kind of a, a genetic like a cinnamon bear yeah, exactly cinnamon, yeah, yeah you got okay. it okay yeah and and this this lion was doing well because he was younger and he had two brothers and when these lions aren't colored they don't blend in as much because you know they have a different coloration they're more noticeable you know for prey and stuff like that so he would follow along with these two brothers and you know based on whatever the kills they would share the kill so he was doing pretty good actually but when you see this animal it's absolutely amazing you know it's like uh, yeah Yeah, it's amazing. The, the eye coloring. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I, I only thought White Lion was a band, pretty, you know, a bad 80s metal band, if you remember that. But, uh, yeah. Wait, wait. I never had a chance. When the children cry. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't like to admit it too much, but yes, that's for sure. All right. My, my volume was off, so they couldn't hear what I just said, I don't think. But anyway, uh, Mark Stroll just commented the same time that, that Josh made a reference to weight. Uh, Mark Stroll <laughs> in the comments said something about that song. Yeah, this I got kind of looks like the album cover, by the way. It's, you know, it was similar. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I, I get I'm on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm off mute now. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. OK, so we're going to go to <laughs> I'm off mute. We're good. OK, we're going to go to uh, non non bird. I think you listed. I think you told me I'm going to I'm going to make this a little smaller so everybody can see the full full image. You said this was one of your favorite moments of the year. I believe you told me that these. Yeah. Uh, the bison. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was one of those things where, you know, you're patient. So we were in, um, this was not Lamar Valley. This was Hayden Valley in Yellowstone. This was in January and it was obviously super cold. And it's amazing. If anyone ever has gone to Yellowstone in winter, you know, I mean, it's the, in my opinion, it's the best time to be in Yellowstone. It's absolutely stunning because you have that snow cover and you have, you know, even midday, you have diffuse light. That snow acts as a huge um, diffusion filter. So, it's, it, it's just awesome, especially for high key scenes of minimalism and so forth. And we're in Hayden Valley. We stopped and there are hundreds of bison just coming in rows and rows. And this particular um, row was coming up and that that's a berm. They're actually coming up to cross the road. We pulled on the side of the road. But um, this this line of bison were they they didn't in, they didn't intersect with each other. They're evenly spaced, which was cool. And I waited for that moment compositionally. I wanted that. The, the tip, the head of the the lead bison, where he hits the ridge line. So I wanted the lines to come down and, uh, and intersect there uh, in the composition. I like the high key. There's some subtleness in there. The the bison in the middle, you can see the tongue is out, which I think is kind of a nice subtle detail. Uh, cloud cover was pretty cool, um, and it was just one of those moments. I, I, I it was just fun. It really came together nicely. Uh, I don't know what I shot this with. Maybe a seventy to two hundred. I was relatively I, close. I scrolled but, uh, in. And I've always said this, like, it, and listen, I, I sometimes I throw things around and I, I, I want to be very careful. I, I'm always sensitive that not everybody can afford everything. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy. So my kids are out of college. I actually do a second job to afford wildlife gear. You know, um, I always say that everybody should have a 70 to 200 if you're a wildlife photographer, especially if you're shooting non-birds at all because it's it's a super versatile lens it's super sharp it's easy to carry around you can you can modify it you can get away with some macro type wildlife you know like insects bugs flowers it works really really well throw a converter on there some extension tubes you can you can modify it it's a it's a terrific lens um it's a little short if you're doing bird photography especially for smaller birds but man if you can do two lenses and you've got your big lens um, and, and you get, and you're looking at a, at a second lens. It really is a, is a magnificent lens yeah. to work with. And, um, just curious for those people that might, might be like, Oh, I, you know, I want, I want to go to Yellowstone or I want to go to that area. Um, are you on a, on like a guide? Uh, is, is it, is there a guide there or have you been there a few times and you kind of know the lay of the land or do you have to, in winter, do you need, do you have to have a guide? Yeah, that's a great question. So in Lamar Valley, we just drive around ourselves. We know it very well. well actually, we know the park pretty well. Um, so we did not have a guide. But in order to get into certain areas of the park, such as this in Hayden Valley, you have to have a snow coach take you. So you get on this huge snow coach. It looks like Bigfoot. <laughs> and they take you up uh, into the mountains and you drive around. And of course, as you see things, you get out and, and take photos. So for this, um, uh, guide is probably a strong word, but you need to have the only way to get access to these areas is you have to pay the okay. park to get on a snow coach for that. Okay. Yeah. And I was, I, I thought with a lot of access and I've never been, so I, I know a, a lot of times in winter there, I don't want to, I don't want to give people the impression you just jump in your car and drive out <laughs> because if you've ever seen a snow coach and I've seen pictures of them, they're monstrous vehicles. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. A Toyota Celica would not make it. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to give you my, so these are favorite moments. Now I showed one of your favorite moments. I'm going to show one of my favorite moments. This is a up in, up in past your neck of the woods. Actually. I'm jealous of this encounter. Yeah. I, it was super. I've spent so much time trying to get great shots of grouse. Yeah. They're they're So in, in Pennsylvania, the, the, the grouse is the state bird of Pennsylvania. Yep. And it used to be everywhere, everywhere. And now there's none like they're I shouldn't say none, but they're very, very difficult. I've seen, and I've been birding for 10 years pretty, pretty seriously. So I'm in the woods a lot. I've heard them 
Like you can hear them drumming once in a while. They have a really odd call. If you've ever heard the, just, just them calling, not drumming, but calling, it's a little weird. Like it's a little eerie. I've heard it once or twice. Um, but to see them, I've only seen them twice. Like good looks. Once was perched in a tree, terrible. It was over my head. I'm driving down this road. And I, I drove up to, to Northern Pennsylvania and I'm going to do it again this year. It's just, there's so many state game lambs up there just driving on back roads. These roads aren't even on maps. They're just, you just get on a road and you just drive. And um, I see one bird start to come out in the road and I stop the car and I open the door and I, I scooch under the door and I'm afraid to interrupt. So I just stay there. Now this has cropped in quite a bit. So these were about probably 150 feet away, maybe 100 feet away. They're not Not close, not as close as they look. But I had a pretty nice look at them. And it was really interesting just to watch. You know, the male, I think the male is on the left, but it looked like he kind of walked around, you know, and they were kind of like circling each other. And then they just stopped for a moment right in the middle of the road and did this. And then they they kind of walked out. And it was the whole, you know, with wildlife, I think one of the things that you still appreciate and I still appreciate is just moments. So it's not always the image. And I'm going to I'm going to show another one that that exemplifies that. Sometimes what's great about it is just the moment. And as much as I think the image here is nice, it was just seeing a bird that's our state bird. You don't see it very often. It's courtship. They're engaged with each other. You know, I didn't feel intrusive at all, even though it was me on their area. Um, it felt like I was just there to witness it. Like I was just there to watch it. And it was really, really special. So I'm not trying to get too sappy on you here, but but I think you can relate to a little bit of that sometime. Oh, yeah. Big time. By the way, um, Russell was asking before about shooting in New Hampshire and Maine. When I was in Maine, I was in this area, Wrangley, and I asked this guy, he was like a, the local shop guy, said, and he seemed to know a little bit about birds. Now, I have a bit of an accent when I talk to, so I shouldn't make too much fun. But I said to the guy, I said, hey, you got any grouse around here? I hear some grouse in a good spot. He goes, I don't know about grouse. We got partridge. just partridge all over the place. You got the partridge. And I said, you tell me where the partridge is, and I'll go shoot it. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're less skittish up there. There's more of them. West Niles devastated them, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and they're skittish cause they're hunted all the time. Yep. So it's very tough. Um, yep. even if you find a drumming log, you have to be really far away and get there at night. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to get these birds. Yeah. Yep. All right. So let me get on to, uh, I'm going to go through, we've got a couple more here. I'm going to go through two more of mine real quick. These are, these are kind of favorite moments. So I'm going to go through two of mine, and then I'm going to get to to one of your favorite moments in, in an image coming up that is absolutely, I'm telling you, I don't think I saw this before, Josh, but I'm getting, I was blown away. Yeah, blown away. Mm. But let me let me get to two more two more of mine. This, by the way, I'm going to ask you this. This is this is probably uh, may have been the highlight of my year, and also my biggest fail of 2022. Mm. Same 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 event. So I'm sitting I'm sitting on a on a on a rock up in the middle of the mountains in October, late October. And the, there's nothing. It's dead silent. There's no activity at all. And this turkey vulture flies up from behind me. Now, turkey vultures pop up around 9 a.m. there, and they, they kind of hover around the valley. And I look over, and thinking nothing of it, and I and as, as this turkey vulture turns, it's got the golden nape. And mm. I'm like, and I die. Because this bird is close I, i'm guessing maybe 100 feet like that for a golden eagle in pennsylvania never happens if this this i am convinced i will never see a golden eagle in pennsylvania this close in my life and then there's another one that pops up behind them and there's two of them and they kind of like circle around me you could see the mountain ridge there and i am my heart is racing i am dying i'm just dying so i take this image this is actually a by the way it's a very big file so this was the vertical and another vertical stitched together to make a, a uh i'm sorry two horizontals stitched together to make a vertical all right so i take two of them and i stitch them together because the wing actually was it was tight in the frame that's how close they were like they're really really close i get home here so here, that's the moment right i'm just i'm in heaven i'm like this is the greatest day <laughs> i've had all year and my you know i get home jpeg the whole series in jpeg mm. I have, I, I don't, I don't know. One thing I will tell you, um, the mirrorless cameras have touch screens on the back. I am convinced I, I was, I hit the touch screen in the back. I'm convinced I hit something and didn't realize it. 
and never realized it until I got home that I shot this whole batch in JPEG. And the reason it's a big deal is because they were all backlit. And when you shoot backlit images and you want to like pull up shadows, it's a lot easier to do with a raw file. So anyway, uh, this was my number one moment and yeah, my biggest cool. fail. So I'm going to ask you, Josh, uh, what's your biggest fail of 2022? Do you have, do you have one of those like I blew it. I absolutely blew this one. One thing really quick uh, on the Golden Eagles. I was at Hawk Mountain in 2012. I think it was November 4th of 2012. I think I, I remember the date. It was the ba it was a banner day for Golden Eagles. And I think 45 to 50 flew by. And it was amazing. I didn't have my camera. I was just birding or whatever. But um, to see Golden Eagles, especially like that close in Pennsylvania, it's it's a surreal experience. These birds, I th some of them actually, I've talked to some biologists they um, will spend the winter in Pennsylvania. They feed on snowshoe hares and some mm -hmm. of the other areas in the north. And some of them will migrate through. They go to the Smoky Mountains. But these are birds that are like breeding in uh, you know Canada and stuff like that. Yep. Um, you know, biggest fail. I'm trying to think. Uh, there are so many. There's always so many when you're photographing wildlife. Um, Did you ever shoot in JPEG for a whole day? Yeah. Um, and what happens is when I do software updates, um, you know, you update this, the firmware in your camera for whatever reason. Uh, and I've sent some cameras to Canon to get fixed. It comes back and it's in JPEG. Everything gets reset. And I've done that. I've gone out and shoot. And, and like, thankfully, um, they haven't been really great <laughs> shots. So, <laughs> But um, yeah, I have made that mistake before. Oh, biggest mistake, I would say, there was a great egret. Um, I call him GE. He was my buddy. And he would he would walk literally 10 feet, maybe even closer than that, right in front, and hunt right around me. So I had the perfect day, the perfect light, and I didn't think he was going to be out. And I think I had um, a 100 to 500 on me. And I, if I would have had my wide angle, I would have been able to get amazing stuff and perspectives with this bird. Like if I had a 24 to 105, I could have probably shot him at 24 millimeter. It would have been incredible. Um, I posted some stories on Instagram a little while back and with this bird just walking all around and just natural behavior, just didn't care I was there. But that was my biggest screw up. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this bird. And then fall weather came, storms came, and I never saw him again. He, he uh, moved out. So that was my big, that was my big fail, I would say. All right. And I'm going to do, so now my next one is another great moment I had from 2022. And I'm going to, I'm going to show it because I, I lined it up this way to compare it to one of your great moments of 2022 and one of your favorite images. So I was in uh, the Outer Banks. So it, interesting, we both took the same species <laughs> in the same general location, but look at the difference in these two images. By the way, I thought mine was pretty good until I saw Josh's. Completely different styles. All right, so mine is shot, let me go down to the camera. All right, mine is shot with a D500. So when I go to the beach, I don't like to take my best gear. So I take my D500, which is my an older body, and I take a really old 300 2.8. So sand gets in there, you know, whatever. I don't really care. And it, I figured for the horses, 300 millimeters, I don't really need much more than that. So I shoot this at 300 millimeters, um, and he's scratching. Like he's he's like rubbing the tree one way, and and he walks around the tree, and I'm waiting for him to come around. And he comes around, and he peeks his head, and he just holds it there. Now, the horse people tell me that they can identify that face, like the, the way the nose is, um, that that's like a, they could tell, I don't know, it's like a facial expression for horses. Uh, Nikki Nobles is on here. She's a horse person. Maybe she can comment on that. So um, I thought it was really pretty. And this particular horse was really, really dark, but it had this like sun bleached mane. You know, it kind of reminded me of that person that, that, that hangs out at the beach all year with the and the hair gets all like beachy. So it felt really beachy to me. Anyway, so I really, I'm looking at this like, ah, it's a pretty good wild. I call them wild horses, by the way. I, I have been corrected. They are feral horses. Do not call them wild horses, Josh. I don't know really? If you I, I just, I always call them Spanish Mustangs. I, I don't know yeah. much about it, but. Um, I just call them wild horses. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of debate on, you know, they're where they come from, Spanish, when, how long, what the genetics are and everything else. But it's, it's, in, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. So now look at the difference. So again, I like this. It's one of my favorite. And it was, it was more Great about my, the moment. I just liked the moment. Like it was just really neat to watch this horse. Um, and then Josh takes this picture and I'm like, Jesus, I suck. So <laughs> <laughs> this is, a, this is it's, a, just a, it's just uh, a different perspective, obviously. It's a, <laughs> Josh, don't be humble. No, no. it's a, My we shot were, is trash. 
Uh, no, I was with Kerm, uh, and we were there in August. And this was down in North Carolina in the Outer Banks uh, with Corolla, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And it's like a highway. You've been there, Scott. Where you're yeah. on the beach, there's That's four or five cars around. It's actually, you know, your anxiety level goes up because you're driving fast. You don't want to get stuck, and all mm-hmm. these cars are going by you. I've been so stuck we in. This, for- I've been stuck in the sand with Kerm Khan, by the way. Yeah. yeah and, oh yeah. yeah he is, he's not afraid. I'm glad he was behind the wheel because I would be white knuckling it the whole way. <laughs> so we were just moving. And, uh, you know, so we're, we went all the way up the beach and we're making our way back, you know, looking for opportunities. This huge storm was gathering on the horizon. It was coming in from the east. And I mean, it was an epic storm and it was right at the beginning of the storm. And we we're in, actually near the exit. And we saw this, uh, this horse, I was going to say Mustang. I'm not sure what to call it now, but this horse, and it was it was a dark horse. It was a black horse, and it was up on this dune, and you could see the storm clouds around it. You know, it was like this big anvil coming in. Uh, I went vertical because I love the textures in the cloud. Um, this shot appealed to me. There was I, I took this, I think, at maybe thirty five millimeter. Uh, it was a wider wider angle. Um, the kick, the leg was going up like that. You could see the leg go up. So that one stood out in the sequence to me. Um, again, shot it vertically. Went black and white. Again, the textures in the clouds, but just that whole environment. And just a few minutes after the shot, I mean, it just downpour, lightning, thunder. I mean, it was insane. A couple inches, a couple of inches of water just came crashing down. The beach got, um, everything got soaked, but it was amazing. That's when these uh, opportunities create themselves. Whenever you're at the cusp of bad weather or right after bad weather moves yeah. through, you know, uh, but we just got really lucky. Uh, with the weather this shot would be nothing if there wasn't you know a storm coming through so. one, of, one of the only snowy owls i've ever photographed and in, in my favorite also on a beach with kurum khan on um the edge of bad weather so we were on a, snow, a <laughs> snowstorm on the beach and on on a four-wheel drive access beach with kurum <laughs> and he got stuck uh, that's a oh, whole did he? Story. Yeah. oh yeah it's a whole nother story yeah. Because his, he, I don't know if I, I'm sure he he knows this better than me. Whenever you're on in these areas, he's like, you don't want to get stuck. So the way not to get stuck <laughs> is you got to go faster. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, he's right. You yeah, he slammed on the brakes. But it, it okay. So quick story. It was Mark Stroll's fault. <laughs> Mark Stroll yelled out the window. So we see <laughs> there's a snowy owl perched up in the dunes, and he yells, "Ow!" And Kerm instinctively, of course, what are you going to do? You slam yeah. on the brakes. At that point, you're done because you're on a beach. Oh, man, that was a good day. But anyway, uh, apparently Kerm Khan is good luck on beach dunes with uh, yeah. bad weather. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the the thing that's neat about this is that you can see the band of clouds. Like it's it's not just like a big cloudy day. I mean, this is like a band of really intense. And I'm curious about uh, post-processing. I know you, I've asked you a couple questions, but I think the audience mm-hmm. sometimes gets, gets curious about this too. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing there's not like a whole lot. It maybe you increase the contrast a little, but that's it, it's kind of like the clouds look kind of like they that's what they were. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was some light coming in, obviously, because the storm was generating. So it was nice as there was light coming in on the side of the cloud yeah. that was hitting the horse. That's why you get the nice silhouette on yep. the horse. Um, what I did uh, on the clouds, uh, clarity. I used the clarity slider, I think it was. So I, I moved the clarity slider up, which adds a lot of texture and contrast. Because, you know, when you look at the clouds, other than that, it was a typical black and white conversion. You know, everything else yeah. was uh, looks a million times better in black and white versus. Oh, color, absolutely. No doubt. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. And, you know, it's just sometimes it just things line up perfectly. The fact that the horse is in the lightest part, it stands out because if yeah. it was if there was a dark cloud behind it, you'd have to edit it more or, you know, do yeah. something more. But the fact that the light was coming from the left side of the image and and also just note. And I don't know how much cropping was done here, but it's almost full frame. Actually, I, I was going to say, like, yeah. notice the composition. My guess is in camera, you know, where yeah. where you're like, OK, you know, thinking like a wildlife photographer, here's what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to compose it in camera, because if you center, if you like a lot of people just instinctively compose centered and then crop to get the composition. But when you do that, you lose a lot of pixels in an image like this. You don't want to lose those pixels like you right. want the kind of the depth of this image and the the breadth of how powerful that scene is. So yeah, yeah. really, really, really great If you great can compose in camera, I always do it. And even with AI now and auto, auto focus tracking on the mirrorless, 
you can put, you know, put your subject anywhere in the frame. And again, it's, you know, you have to think a little bit on your feet when you're in these situations. So if I moved further down the beach, the horse would be in front of the clouds and you wouldn't have the light behind it. So just the little moving left to right, or, you know, you position your, you put yourself in a situation where you have the light behind it. So. Yeah. Okay. And I got one more image. So I think you said this was one of your favorites, if not favorite of 2022. Yeah, it was I'm, an incredible experience. Yeah. It was accidental. You know, it was just, yep. we thought we were going to photograph horses, but then the storm came in. It's like, all right. <laughs> yeah. And then this was my favorite from 2022. I've put this on social media a couple of times. Um, I had this day and it, it started off really awful. I went, I went to one of my favorite spots, early migration. I was hoping to get a couple early migrants and they had done construction. They, they basically just, one of those power line cuts and they leveled it. They put up new poles and they just bulldozed. The neat thing about it is it was all, it was mostly native plants. So there was tons of like mountain laurel and choke cherry and like all of these great, there was blueberry, like low bush blueberry in there. It was like a great area and they just bulldozed it. And I was devastated. I was like, oh my God, this is never gonna recover. Prairie warblers used to hang out in there. They're gonna be gone. Like they, we just like bulldozed these, this whole territory. So I'm driving home and there's a bunch of vultures on the side of the road on a carcass. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to sit here and watch. And I really didn't have any intention of taking a lot of pictures. I just thought, oh, let me just watch these birds. I got nothing else to do now. And it was really neat to see them because we think of vultures as these, which they are, they're scavengers. We think of as, kind of, you know, like on a carcass, there's little piles of meat hanging off their bill. And, you know, we don't think of them as like these tender birds and then and then you see them like grooming each other and kind of caring for each other and it was neat to watch these two because it was about eight birds here but these two were clearly like a mated pair and you know reading about vultures they they kind of this is what they do they mate and they pair for life if they can and um it was neat to watch them just take care of each other and then in this one moment that where both of their heads were like pointed the same way uh the plants down here, unfortunately, are invasive, but they they are pretty purple. So I threw them into the composition as well, just to get some color in there. But I really, really like this image. I called it tenderness. Um, so that's kind of what I was thinking. And before, I, I don't want to wrap up yet. Uh, if anybody has, and I do have a question about 2023. So it's first day of 2023. I do want to find out from you, Josh. I, I don't have a lot of plans for 2023. A couple things on the on the bucket list. But do you have anything intentional or any trips planned yeah, you know, in the near term, I've got a decent amount of tundra swans that are hanging out locally here in the back. So I'm waiting for fog or snow, and I want to get close to them if I can and get some shots of tundras. That's my big goal in the immediate future. And uh, we're actually putting a trip together. We're going to head to Shetland in June. So to photograph puffins and seabirds and stuff like that, gannets. Um, so looking forward to that. But that's going to be the big trip this year for the summer. And for, and for those birds, um, so in the United States, there's really only one spot to get puffins. It's very controlled. You kind of shuttle, it's very tour-like. But when you go to other parts of the world, England, the UK, you, you can get puffins just kind of hanging out. Yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. I won't bring my 600. I mean, most of the shooting is probably 24 to 105, 70 to 200. You were talking about before, incredible lens. So hopefully I can bring everything in a backpack. <laughs> it's it's a lot less stress too yeah. when you're traveling. So uh, never been there. Um, you know everything I've seen. It looks absolutely stunning. It looks beautiful. Um, so uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, and um, so that that's and, and any other trips. Uh, you don't really do much in South America. Do you have any interest in that? I was in Ecuador years ago. Um, when was I there? Uh, it was mostly birding in the cloud forest. It was incredible. I'd like to get there at some point. Um, actually, the, over the past couple of years, I've been getting in the macro, you know, invertebrates, mm -hmm. snakes, frogs. Mm -hmm. I would love to do that down there. Yeah. Um, Peter Bambusek, um, I don't know. Some folks may know Peter. Um, I've been following his work. He's a fellow judge with me in a photo competition and he runs stuff down there and, you know, he talks about it a lot, but it's very inspiring. I'd love to get down there yeah. um, at some point. Definitely right. though. I'm going to try to, I'm just goofing around with my, uh, I don't know how to use this software. All right, I think I just screwed everything up. Sorry, Josh. I think <laughs> I just screwed our whole, our whole program up. Um, <laughs> so now we're just looking at a big duck. With you and I sideways. I was trying to blow up our screen, but like I said, I've had so many technical. If it, yeah, all right, there we go. Now we're back up. Um, 
yeah, I don't have much. I don't have much intentional planned in 2022. Um, you know, as a wildlife photographer, after about five years, you can get a routine. I think we'll do another show. Maybe I'll, I'll invite you back for another show just around like the sequencing and the like kind of this annualization um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes how to how it can be very productive, but also it can be like a rut that you get into where oh, I can go here in June and there in May and you have these locations, but then you kind of end up with the same stuff. So um, I don't have anything particular planned. I just wanted to thank everybody. Uh, Aaron Todd jumped on here and asked, is Josh going to be involved in wild art photography the year 2023? So you were a judge for wild art photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In 2022. Yes, I will be actually looking forward to it. Um, Aaron did awesome this year. Um, he had some incredible images actually that were uh, featured in the contest and they're I think one of his images is in the is a finalist as well. Um, but yeah, no, looking forward to that. Very inspiring um, when you see some of the imagery that's come through. I mean, his images, along with a lot of other photographers around the world, it's it's inspiring and it's a lot of fun to be a part of just to see. It, it's more um, there's more of an artistic focus on the photography versus behavior, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know when you look at some of the compos the compositions um, abstracts we have and a few other categories. It, it's a lot of fun. I, I would encourage anybody um, who's listening to check the competition out. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? You you don't really do this as a business in any way. So I mean, I, you can plug anything you want. Buy one of Josh's <laughs> prints. Buy the horse print or something. Like you still yeah, sell. Yeah. Yeah. Send me a note. I, I, I do do prints and it's I don't market it. Folks will reach out to me. And through Smug Mug, you know, I use Bay Photo and I'll send prints out. I, once I get my renovations done and some things I've got a, uh, Canon, what image, image graph pro 1000. So I do like to print. I've been printing for a number of years now. I love it. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to print, let me know. But other than that, I, um, but you I, I just pretty much shoot you, on my own when I have time. Yeah. Cause this is, I mean, for you, you're, you're a part-time photographer. This is not a yeah. full-time job for you. You have a full-time no. job and, um, yeah, I, I think your passion comes through. I love having you on the show. I, we could talk for longer, but I, God, we have, we've already gone for a while. So well, I, I think, I think we're going to, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, if there's any more questions, I'll answer them later. Hit me on Instagram. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, good night to everybody. Thanks for tuning in for the 2022 recap. We've done this for a couple years in a row. Josh book me next year, New All Year's right. day. We're going to do it again. I don't know what day of the week it'll fall on. Maybe we'll do it, uh, the Sunday after, but and if I only do one sh live show again, it'll be with you <laughs> next year. Um, thanks and, and, and come down for ducks. I'm, I down. listen. Bring your flow blind. I'm coming. I'm telling. I, I told Josh I'm coming. I have days off in February. <laughs> I'm coming down. The water in Maryland. We're going to be on the bay together. Uh, I, I'm expecting. Of course, I'll go down there and I'll I'll break something or lose something or drop something <laughs> in the water. But uh, yeah, we'll try to figure it out. But anyway, I just wanted to say thanks for to Josh for coming on. Thanks for the live audience today. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. If you have personal questions, you can shoot me a message at any time on Eskies Images, either on eskiesimages at gmail.com or on my social media accounts at Eskies Images. And uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up. So I don't have any I don't have any fancy music like my old videos. I just I think I just gotta say goodbye and hang up. So I'm gonna stop the stream. Happy New Year, everybody. You guys Thanks. have a good night.